Uh, let's talk about number one, uh, using data, using uh, the foundational data that we have laid out county by county all throughout the state of California. Uh, we are now putting forth guidelines that say schools can physically open for in-person education when the county that they're operating in has been off our monitoring list for 14 consecutive days. Uh, if you've tuned into these uh, daily briefings, you're very familiar with our monitoring list. I'll be updating that list later in the presentation today. Uh, but we are now putting forth guidelines that say, based on the data, based upon the background spread, the community spread uh, of the virus, uh, that if you are not on that monitoring list, you can move forward as a county uh, if you choose to physically open uh, your campus, physically open uh, your schools. However, schools that don't meet this requirement, they must begin the school year this fall through distance learning. Number two, and I'm gonna get to that in a moment. Number two, uh, we're putting forth a new mask requirement in the state. All school staff and students, all staff and students in third grade and above must wear masks. Students in the second grade or below, we strongly encourage uh, wearing masks and face shields. I have a very young uh, son, uh, Dutch, um, and caregivers, when he first see, saw masks, uh, he naturally recoiled. Uh, a lot of caregivers now have face shields, and he can see their expressions, their humanity, and that's why we put specifically guidance out as it relates to not just masks, but face shields as well. Well, our third frame of guidance that we're putting forth today is around physical distancing and, as I mentioned, other adaptations. So on the physical distancing side, uh, we believe that it's incumbent upon staff to maintain at least a six-foot distance between each other and a six-foot distance between themselves and the students. Uh, we believe that school day should start with symptom checks, meaning temperature checks. Uh, we have robust expectations around hand washing stations, uh, sanitation, deep sanitation, deep disinfection uh, uh, efforts, uh, and that these schools have, along the lines of the adaptations, uh, have quarantine protocols. And we'll talk a little bit more in a moment about these continuity and attendance plans that each school site is now responsibly, uh, responsible for putting forth. Uh, as it relates to the issue of testing, uh, there's a requirement uh, that we test on a rotating basis a cohort of staff uh, on a consistent basis. Dr. Galley will talk a little bit more about that. And in turn, we are bringing uh, to the school system uh, the benefit and support of the 10 plus thousand contact tracers uh, that we have trained here in the state of California in partnership uh, with uh, UCSF in UCLA uh, with a backbone uh, and a database that now has organized uh, a collective. We want to turn our contact tracing uh, where we think it can be very effective uh, in these school um, uh, environments, could be very effective uh, in mitigating the spread and trying to understand uh, exactly uh, where and how the spread uh, had advanced and allow us, obviously, to isolate and quarantine uh, cohorts of not only children, but staff uh, as it relates to mitigating that spread further. As it relates to distance learning, as I said, rigorous. Access to devices is one thing, and connectivity, it's foundational. And in a moment, I'll talk about the money we have put up to allow for districts to purchase new devices to get the kind of connectivity uh, that our students need and deserve to address uh, this yawning gap as it relates to the digital divide. Uh, we want daily live interaction with teachers and other students. Students connecting peer-to-peer -peer with other students, teachers connecting daily on an interactive frame uh, to advance our distance learning efforts. Remember, we had a lot of uh, experience that came through uh, the spring this year. Uh, we reviewed a lot of the fits and starts related to quality, access issues, uh, points of consideration and concern, we shared a lot of those best practices. Uh, no one is going to deny uh, that based upon uh, the early orders to start to close schools at the local level, uh, that uh, some of it 
uh, worked more effectively in certain parts of the state than others. Clearly, we have work to do to make sure that we are doing rigorous distance learning. But this is the predicate, the foundation. These are the expectations that we have, minimum expectations in terms of quality, engagement, connectivity, uh, and access to the devices that are foundational in terms of providing uh, for quality distance learning. Uh, we also want to create a challenging environment where assignments are equivalent in terms of what you would otherwise get in an in-person class setting. I'm not naive, and again, we stipulate, that second slide I showed, that staff, that teachers, that parents prefer the social-emotional learning of in-class education. That is a default, that's our bias but under the circumstances with the spread of this virus, and I'll get to that spread in a moment as uh, an explanation again as to why at this moment we're putting out this recommendation uh, that we want to do our best to create some sense of equivalency uh, with the obvious uh, constraints uh, that is distance learning. We also want to make sure that we are always mindful of our students that are homeless, our students that are foster care uh, kids are in the system, kids with English as second language, and those with learning disabilities, uh, those that have special needs uh, and the like.